Well, good morning. I've got seven o'clock on the, on the iPhone, so I think it's time to get started. I'm Mike Staten. I'm soybean educator with Michigan State University Extension. I'd like to welcome you to the Field Crops Virtual Breakfast uh, for today, the 8th of August. We have two presenters with us this morning. We have uh, Martin Chilvers, our field crop pathologist, and we also have Jeff Andreessen, our state climatologist. I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Martin Chilvers uh, to talk about tar spot in corn. Good morning, everybody. Um, so let's uh, yeah, give you a bit of an update on field crop diseases. And I think earlier today, I just want to do uh, focus perhaps on tar spot. I think that's the most relevant at this point in time. Um, as I'm talking about this, though, with respect to um, corn diseases, you know, northern leaf blight, grey leaf spot, or a couple of other things we don't want to forget about in corn and, and should be out there scouting for as well. So I'm sure um, quite a few of you now have seen uh, perhaps me talk about tar spot, just, but just in case you haven't. Um, so tar spot, um, as the name suggests, looks like tar has been flecked onto the leaves of the corn plant. Um, and one thing I think that sort of distinguishes it from northern leaf blight and grey leaf spot is that it can look pretty innocuous and then build to levels that are pretty destructive very quickly. Um, so it's, it, it's, it can be a little bit of a tricky one to scout for too. You know, northern leaf blight, grey leaf spot, they're pretty easy to spot, you know, from 10 yards away. Um, tar spot is not. You've really got to be up close to those plants looking for those little lesions. And we had a lot of false positives at the start of the season, so people were out there looking really closely, which was great. Um, a lot of insect uh, frass or insect poop on the leaves. Looks very similar to this tar spot in this particular photo I'm showing here, um, but the insect frass will be quite flat. And the one thing with insect frass is it will rub off the leaf pretty easily, especially with some water, it will tend to dissolve. Um, so that's one test you can do. So any of these tar spot lesions of the tar spot fungus are really embedded in that leaf tissue and have a slight raised um, structure to them. And very often just a very little bit of um, dead tissue or yellow tissue just around um, the uh, tar spot lesion itself. So last year uh, was really the first year that we had an epidemic in Michigan. And so we had about 27 different counties with tar spot in them. And the problem is this fungus can overwinter. So we've got plenty of evidence for that now um, to show that it's, it's quite happy to overwinter. Um, it overwinters on those corn leaves. So as those corn leaves do break down, the fungus is likely to, to die. But there's enough of it you know, there that you know, there's, there's, over, there's overwintering of this, this fungus through that material. Um, and we definitely had you know, significant losses last year in some fields, about five or six counties where we're you know, seeing around about 50 bushel losses. So... From that, what we're sort of seeing here is, um, you know, it's an emerging disease. It was first seen in Allegan in Michigan, and that's certainly been one of our epicenter counties here. But now that we've had pretty, you know, substantial levels last year in Mark Calm County and others, I fully expect that, you know, to be an issue sort of going forward. Um, and as the season progresses, you know, it may very well hit the thumb later this year. I don't expect to yield losses this year. Um, it seems very slow compared to last year. Um, for the most part, but it's, it's starting to pop up again this year. And again, 2018, um, other states surrounding uh, Lake Michigan, you know, also confirmed um, task spot by the end of the season. So this is just a cumulative map of wherever we've had positives over the last few years um, through 2018. So moving into this season then, um, we've got a number of counties now where we've got confirmations, which about seven or eight counties now uh, with confirmations. So those red Red highlights on the counties are confirmed. The yellow is possible um, and green is, you know, we've checked, but we haven't found it yet. In those situations where we've found it, there's been sort of mixed results so far. So where it's on a plant here and there, I, I probably wouldn't be too concerned at this point in time. But where it's on most plants, even at very, very low levels, I'd be very concerned. And I, if it was me, I'd be putting a fungicide on. Um, somewhere in this early reproductive timings to help make sure that that's under control. And the other thing that we're seeing this year, again, it's, it's very, very slow to start. So a lot of these other states near us um, have also reported tar spot, but very low levels, um, except, you know, maybe under irrigation or close to the lake uh, where we've got you know, more moisture um, in the field. 
So definitely something to really be paying attention to right now and perhaps making fungicide applications. And, and I'll be up in um, Isabella and Gratiot later today having a look around and see what else we have out there. Just in terms of when it can infect and sort of how quickly it can cycle, I guess. So here's a photo I, I grabbed off of um, Twitter from last year. So this is a volunteer corn plant um, at the V3 growth stage, so you know, a few weeks old. And, and that already had lesions on it. So it looks like from the greenhouse inoculation studies we've done um, and some of the field observations, it can cycle in around about 10 to two weeks, 10 days to two weeks rather. So spores are gonna infect, land on the plant, infect the leaf, and then in about 10 days or thereabouts, produce those little black structures which can release more spores. So it's, it's quite capable of cycling quickly. And here's another example of why I would recommend a fungicide application. So this is out uh, Steve Kuhlman's uh, place, really um, in, in Allegan County, very close to Lake Michigan. So we were in there last year, about this time of year, August 10th, and every um, plant in the field had some level of disease. But the level of disease was really quite low for the most part. When we did ratings on the ear leaf, some ear leaves had no disease and others had one or two spots on them. So it was there, probably a little bit heavier down in the lower canopy, but it was there, but you're not at very high severity, nothing you, know, you might be particularly worried about. But from there, it really exploded very, very quickly. So by August 24th, we were up to about you know, 30, 40 tar spot lesions on a leaf. And here's an example of that, that leaf there by August 24th. Um, and by that time, it had also reached up into the tassels and was actually causing lesions on the tassels. And then we came back September 7th and essentially the whole field was dead. So again, it's just, it's, it's one of these things I think it's it catch us off guard a little bit because it is sort of somewhat sneaky, you know, compared to um, northern leaf blight and grey leaf spot. So here's a couple of photos, you know, just showing you again, you know, August 24th, by August 24th, visible from the air as well um, drone. and so that's something um, to sort of keep in mind you know, in terms of scouting you might want to um, think about using a drone to get up there sort of mid-August to see where your fields are at because I know corn is difficult to get through but then you know there's very heavily infected areas they ended up lodging as well so that's what I'm trying to show there on the, on the right hand side so last year we sprayed this at the R3 growth stage, August 10th, you know, corn is a little bit more ahead of things than compared to where a lot of fields are this year. Um, and um, coming back September 7th, you can see that, you know, where we hadn't sprayed a fungicide, things were dead. Uh, where we had, we'd preserved green leaf area. And basically the, the short story of this is, you know, use a mixed motor action fungicide. Um, there's a number that, um, Trigger Pro is labelled and there are a number of um, other fungicides um, that have the uh, emergency exemption label. Um, and in terms of standability too, that fungicide really had a, a pretty significant effect on standability. So where we didn't spray, you know, the, the, um, the plants were going down pretty heavily and where we had, there was still reasonable stalk integrity. Um, something else that we saw last year as well was the impact on silage. So if we're producing silage, we're, we're going to chop this corn. We, we really want to be aware of that too. Um, so here's a field shot to that grower. Um, I think in, in mid to late August, the field looked frosted to him. Uh, the back end, you know, where we had a little bit more moisture, it's a little bit of a, a lower area of the field. Um, so again, maybe getting up with a drone if you have one to have a bit of a look, see what you can see it might be helpful in terms of trying to make a plan with respect to harvest. And I guess um, the important thing here with, with harvest in, in terms of silage is perhaps getting in there in a timely manner. So once things really you know, brown, brown down like they did here with the tar spot, you know, our biggest problem was the moisture in that corn and it dropped to 20%, so, so too low for silage production. So again, if we know where disease is at, maybe getting in and chopping those severely affected parts of the field first. Um, so something just to consider. Um, there's no mycotoxin associated with this disease, unlike you know ear molds, where we'd also be concerned about the mycotoxin. Um, but it does also affect the, the quality of the feed, so the um, the energy content and the indigestible content, uh, contents increase. In terms of management, then, um, so hybrid resistance is going to be key. But you know, I know we've sort of all been caught off guard by this because it's such a new disease. 
Um, so we've, we've, and we're obviously stuck with what we have out there this year at this point in time. So really the important thing at this point in time is to get that out there in Scout. Um, a timely fungicide application, so if we're aware of what's going on out in our fields, you know, VT to R2, maybe R3 applications might be something to consider. Um, and again, scouting, really being aware of what's going on. And then potentially being prepared to harvest early too. So we, we ran into some situations last year where, where folk were having issue um, harvesting, um, the losing, losing grain um, onto the ground. So, so get out and again, check the quality of those ears because it tends to shrink the ears up um, and the, uh, the grain tends to fall out of the ears pretty easily. So something to consider. Um, planting in the corn will have increased the risk. So if I'm going to out, go out and scout one or two fields, I'm going to look at corn on corn and certainly irrigated locations. They're going to be greater risk. Um, but rotation does not eliminate risk of disease. We've had um, fields last year that mole board ploughed and they had you know, very high levels of disease. So that's, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get disease. And irrigation, I think, was really the big thing as well last year. It was really surprising how much that drove disease. So be very, very careful with irrigation. Um, and so we, we'd really like your help too in just keeping track of where this disease is at. So we'd like to know, you know, when and where you first see disease. And if you can pick one of the two of those fields that you can keep going back to over the rest of the season, that would be fantastic to look at um, disease progression. Um, so just writing an instant, you know, an estimate of the number of plants infected would be helpful, like how many out of 100, um, and where the disease is at on the plant, is it lower canopy, mid or upper, would be very helpful, and just some sort of estimate of severity, and I can certainly provide some disease rating scales if, if you would like that. And just a final note, we have a, a large field trial organised out in Allegan County that we just sprayed our R1 treatments on, on yesterday. Uh, we did everything we could to try and ensure that we would get disease, but at the moment we don't have disease in that particular field. I know there's disease just to the east of Hamilton, um, so it's certainly in that, that county and other fields around as well, so it should develop. So we certainly plan to have a, a field day in Allegan, um, hopefully at our field trial location where we can show you a task spot, but if not we might um, put that somewhere else in Allegan where we have task spot to, to discuss. Um, so that's going to be September 18th, um, starting at about 2 o'clock. Um, yeah, and there's my contact details. And if you have any questions, I'd be quite happy to take them now. This is Chris Defonzo here. I would just make a comment that, uh, Marty, I don't know how late you, were, you would be thinking of spraying and putting fungicides on, but I think your fungicides could be tank mixed with insecticides. Uh, for some of these ear feeding caterpillars, but I don't know how late I would spray those either. So uh, once these caterpillars are down in the ear, they're hard to kill. But the tank mixes would certainly be possible. Yeah, that's a, a really good comment, Chris. Absolutely. Um, I mean, so with respect to the task spot, like optimal timing, we're still trying to figure that out. Um, definitely the reproductive stages are going to be far more beneficial than you know, early vegetative stages, um, unless for some reason there's like really high levels in that early vegetative corn. So. Absolutely, tank mixing when it's appropriate would be very, um, very smart thing to do. So we, you know, we went up to R3 last season. We'd have to double check labels um, to see how late we can go with that. And obviously, you know, if you if you come in really late, and again, you know, you want to be careful thinking about these as rescue treatments, right? If we've got very, very high levels of disease, you're not necessarily going to shut that that down, right? So we want to be um, proactive, again, scouting, knowing what's there and, and trying to make that application probably between R1 and R3. Again, double checking that label. Yeah, and, and also scouting for what insects are there and if they're actually there. And like I said, I, I think for, for a lot of these fields, it would be too late anyway for the, for the insecticides, but just wanted to mention that. For sure. Marty, I don't see any more questions in the, in the chat box. If you do have some for Marty, though, please uh, go ahead and continue to type them in, and, and we will get those addressed. On your screen right now, you're going to see that uh, MSU is just a reminder that we have some really solid resources available to help with the delayed planting uh, challenges that we face this year and all the problems that those are continuing to create for or potentially create for producers across the state. So this website is a compilation of those resources. It's a, a growing a resource that's going to be available, so please check that out. We also have this, uh, we want to thank you for attending. Uh, this is a good way for us to get information out to you.
So we really appreciate that. And then finally, there is a survey. And we would appreciate it if you would fill this out. Um, there you see the link on the screen. The link has also been typed into the chat box. So please help us out by, uh, by filling that, that survey out.